pastors. I shared a little bit of this on Tuesday night with those of you that were here uh, for our Tuesday night service. And let me just, um, on a side note, just say this. Uh, if you, are, as, of, as of yet, are not attending Tuesday night Bible studies or Tuesday night services, I want to really encourage you to do so. God is doing an amazing, amazing work. There's just powerful word, powerful declaration, just a, a beautiful move of the Holy Spirit uh, and, and, and through the teaching of his word that's happening in the midweek, not only in, in, in English services on Tuesday, but also in our Spanish services on Wednesday. And so I'd like to encourage you to, to consider coming um, and being a part of that, coming to, to grow and to learn uh, even more so than what you're growing now. I think, I think that service in particular will really assist us and help us in, in, in doing that. But let me just kind of share with you a little bit of, thank you. Let me kind of share with you a little bit of, of, of what's been happening internally and something I, I believe very unique and very special that happened this week. And I shared a little bit on Tuesday. For several months now, and, and more particularly the last several weeks, um, as I believe for many of you, the Lord has really been dealing with me personally, just in my own heart, my own time of prayer, my own time of meditation on the word of God. And as, and I, seek, as I seek the Lord personally, the Lord has really began to, to deal with me uh, with, with these words that his return is very soon. That the coming of the Lord is very soon. Let me, let, very, very at, at hand, let me ask you this. How many of you that just in your heart and in your spirit, how many of you have been feeling that, that something is about to happen, that something is coming, and that the return of the Lord is soon? Let me just see the hands of those that are, that are feeling that. Amen. Many of you. Okay. What that means is that the Holy Spirit is doing his work among his church. Matter of fact, that's one of the reasons why... Um, we have been dealing with the passages of scripture that we're dealing with because uh, the book of Revelation is all about the end times, but in particular, the messages to the church is God getting a hold and getting the attention of the believers, of the Christians, of the church to say, hey, my, 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 my coming is soon. Get your act together. Get your act together. So I hope that you have been hearing the voice of God say, I'm coming soon. And also with the next breath saying, now get your act together. Because that's totally what I'm feeling from the Lord. So I've been feeling this prompting, just, just dealing as I'm reading, as I'm meditating, as I'm praying, feeling that in my heart and in my spirit. This past Tuesday, I was given the opportunity to, to speak to uh, a group of students that are interning here at Bethesda. They are interns at, the, at our church. They spend Tuesdays and Thursdays here. They're serving, they're working, they're taking classes, they're, they're seeking the Lord. A wonderful uh, program, or more than a program, it's a process that they're going through. But I had an opportunity to to speak with them. Uh, a couple of weeks prior, uh, our youth pastor had, had invited me, asked me for that date. And so I had had it in mind, and I kind of had something that I wanted to share with them, a, a teaching. A, um, matter of fact, I love the title. Okay, this is the teaching that I was going to share with them. Wellsprings or toilet bowls? I just, I, that was what I was going to share with them. Okay? I thought it was a good message. I thought it was a, um, something that they would really benefit from. Well springs or toilet bowls. Maybe one day I can, I can share that one with you at another time. But it was Monday night about midnight, and I, and I had this engagement with them to, to bring a, a study for them or a time with them sharing on Tuesday. It was Monday about midnight, maybe 1230 at night. I'm in bed, and, and I hear the voice of God just begin to tell me, is that really what I want to speak to them? To which I responded, I think so. To which God said, think again. Is that really what I want to speak to them? And in reality, as I started to deal with that question, it wasn't, it wasn't really what God wanted to speak to them. It was what I wanted to speak to them. I thought it was a good idea. So I start having this dialogue about midnight with the Lord in my bed, Monday night into Tuesday morning. And I said, okay, Lord, if that's not what you want to speak, then what is it? What do you want to, what do you want to speak to these students? What do you want to speak to these young people? And this is what the Lord told me. I heard him just, just say this. Okay, not, in my, not with my ears, but in my spirit, in my heart. I heard him say this. Teach them how to hear my voice. So I came Tuesday and I stood before them and I didn't have any notes. I didn't have anything very profound. I just knew that God had told me to teach them to hear his voice. Okay? So Tuesday about 11 o'clock, I go in there. I stand before them. I don't really know what I'm going to say. Because God kind of told me to, that my message wasn't really what he wanted to speak to them. So I'm standing in front of them, and I just begin to tell them, let me tell you what happened. And I tell them the story. Last night, though, I heard the Lord tell me to teach you how to hear him. Did you get that? I heard him 
to tell me to teach you how to hear him. So I begin to just talk to them and share with them how the Lord has spoken to me, how I have, I'm, I'm learning, I have learned and still learning to hear the voice of God when he speaks to me. And I was sharing and I was sharing and I was sharing when all of a sudden I see a young man who's in the room. Listen to this. Okay, this, this, is, this is very important. I see a young man who's in the room. He, he, he kind of begins to tremble. One of, our, one of our students who's in the internship, he kind of begins to tremble. And, and, and he he's, doesn't know how to contain himself, doesn't know how to control himself. But he lifts up his hand because he says, I think God is talking to me and I need to say something right now. I said, okay. So he starts to share. And I don't know if Jesse is here this morning or not. Probably, probably not. But he starts to share. And, and, and he's having a difficult time kind of saying, because I think he's just, he's worried about whether he's doing the right thing or not. And finally I said, look, do you, want to, do you feel like you need to say something? He said, yes. I said, well, then just say it. Don't worry about it. Just say it. And as soon as I told him, just say it, he begins to say, well, this is what the Lord is telling me. The Lord is telling me that he's coming. And he just starts to prophesy that he's coming soon. And he, it's not a long time from now, but he's coming soon. And the church needs to get ready. And there's people playing. And he just starts to go off and prophesy. As that student is prophesying, there's another young lady who's sitting at the front of the room. And she begins to weep. And she begins to cry. And I'm looking at her thinking, what, the, what in the world is going on? Because he's prophesying, she's crying. So then I, we kind of let him speak. But when he was done speaking, I look at her and I said, why are you crying? And she said, because the Lord's telling me the same thing. He's and she starts prophesying, he's coming soon. But there's too many people playing games. While she's prophesying, there's another young man over here that raises his hand. And he starts saying, I'm feeling the same thing. The Lord is coming. And this is what he's telling me. And while he, there's, there's another one. I said, okay, finally I just said, look, everybody stop. Write down what God is speaking to you right now. And one by one, these students, high school students, began to prophesy that Jesus Christ was coming soon. I went up to the first one, to the first young man that was prophesying. I went up to him and I told him, I want you to know what you just did. Your prophecy confirmed to me what God has been dealing with me. But then I showed him my notes that I was going to teach in, in service Tuesday night. He's prophesying at about 11.30 in the morning. My notes for Tuesday night service, those of you who were here, were preparing for the rapture of the church. God is speaking. And the thing that I love so much is that what we were experiencing in that moment was so divine, it was a fulfillment of prophecy. Because Joel 2.28 says that in the last days, God would pour out his spirit upon all flesh. Your sons and your daughters would prophesy. And I was seeing it and I was hearing it for myself. So if you're here this morning and wondering, you know, is that really going to happen? Is there such thing as the return of Christ? It, you know, let me just tell you right now, unashamedly and undoubtedly, Jesus Christ is returning for his church. And it is our responsibility to be ready for him. To be ready for him. Now, part of that means that we have to be spoken to clearly and directly. Because if, if we do not speak clearly and directly, then we run the risk of having people think that they're okay before God, but in reality they are not. And as a matter of fact, that was exactly what Jesus himself had to do for the church in the city of Sardis. The church in the city of Sardis, Jesus had to speak very directly to them because if he didn't, they ran the risk of thinking that they were okay, but in reality they were not. And I want you to read with me, Revelation chapter 3, beginning with verse number 1. For the time that we have left, direct your attention and hear what, what God is speaking this morning. Revelation chapter 3, verse 1. To the angel of the church in Sardis, not sardines, Sardis, write, These are the words of him who hold the seven spirits of God, and the seven stars. And we've talked about this the last several weeks. The seven spirits of God is meaning that the one who is speaking is fully, is perfectly, is completely God himself. Seven is the number of completion, the number of fullness. We also know it as a number of perfection, meaning that there is nothing lacking. Okay, It is the fullness of, of a number. Okay, 
When Jesus is referring to himself as the one who holds the seven spirits of God, he is basically saying, I am fully God. So every word that comes out of my mouth is divine. So what we're about to read right now, we need to understand that it is fully the word of God. It is totally and completely divine because it is spoken by God himself, the son of God. And he holds the seven stars. The seven stars were the the pastors of the seven churches. I know your deeds. He says, and and here's what I want us to focus on for a few moments. This is what he tells them. I know your deeds. You have a reputation of being alive, but everybody say, but you are dead. Do you hear what Jesus just told them? You have a reputation of being alive. What does that mean? Let's just break that down. What does that mean? That the people that surround you, when they see you, they see life. When the people that are around you, your community, your co-workers, your family members, your relatives, the people from, from, that, that serve with you and worship with you in church, when they look at you, they see life. You have a reputation of being alive. In other words, listen, there's times where we can deceive other people. There's times when we can deceive ourselves. What Jesus was pointing out to the believers, to the Christians, to the church in Sardis, he was saying, you have a reputation. When people look at you from the outside looking in, they see life, they see activity, they see production according to them. But let me tell you something, while everyone in this world sees you from the outside looking in, God is the only one who sees you from the inside looking out. So while perspection and perception from this point of view can be one thing God has a completely and a totally different perception and perspective of who we really are because while I can only look at you from the outside God looks at you from the inside and he tells them you have a reputation of being alive what does that mean okay let me tell you a little bit about the city of Sardis in the city of Sardis they were known as a prosperous city they were known as a wealthy city they had the 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 cool thing They had the bells, they had the whistles, they had the nice equipment, they had everything that was state of the art. They they were wealthy in themselves financially, they were were well off, and so they were able to do a lot of things. So the other churches of Asia Minor, when they looked upon the church in Sardis, they saw them very active because they had this finance and they had this wealth to, to feed the widows and to clothe the orphans. They had all of these different ministries or outreaches that we would call them today. They were doing all of these wonderful things, these good works that were very active in our modern day we would see it like this it was a church that had a lot of ministry and their ministries were very busy their ministries were very active they were doing good things in the community doing good things for other people they had the latest and the greatest of sound equipment they had a wonderful praise and worship band they had all this equipment they had all this nice facility they had air condition But the perspective and the perception of God being different from everybody else's, while everybody else was looking at them saying, wow, look what they're doing. Look what they have. Look how good that is. Look how awesome that is. God's perspective being different, he says, that's just a reputation. You have a reputation of being alive. In other words, you have an appearance of being alive but from my perspective in reality remember because he's looking from the inside out you're dead let me ask you a question could it be okay and I'm not listen I'm not accusing anyone or any church because the question that I am posing before you is a question that I pose to myself But could it be that in 2015, there are still believers? There are still people within the church. Or there are still entire churches that have a reputation of being alive, but in reality, they're dead. I'm not accusing you. I'm just saying consider the question because I have to consider it for my life. Is it possible that I can think that I'm okay because what I do can look impressive sometimes? 
Is it possible that I can think that I'm right before God because I do good things in his name? But in reality, not be right before him because while my outward appearance is doing good things, my inward condition is really far from God. Is it possible? Let me, let me, let me tell you what that might look like today for a church. Could it be possible that there are churches? And can, I, and can I even ask the question even a little bit more difficult? Could it be possible that our church from the outside looks nice? There's activity. We feed the hungry. We have outreaches. We have good services. Good music. Lights, and they, the lights even dance more than the people dance sometimes. But we have lights, and we have screens and projectors and sounds. We got, we, got, we got bass in our sound system. You feel it sometimes. We have good musicians. Good teaching. But could it be that even in our church, we have been guilty of doing nothing more than entertaining ourselves with these good things. It would be horrible for me to read a passage of scripture like this and not ask myself those difficult questions. Could it be that we clap our hands during the time of praise and worship? I'm not accusing you, I'm just asking questions. Could it be that we clap our hands during the time of praise and worship? Not because our heart is saying, Lord, with each clap of my hand, I'm giving glory and honor to you. I'm applauding you for your works. Or could it be that we just clap our hands because the people next to us and around us and behind us are doing it? Could it be that we sing the songs because there are words written on a screen? Or is it really that we're singing the songs because it's the cry and the desire of our heart? Because if we're singing songs that are really not the cry and the desire of our heart, or if we're clapping our hands for any other reason other than saying, Lord, with the clap of my hand, I applaud your works. If we're doing those things for any other reason, then we have a reputation of being alive, but in reality we may not be. Lord, why do I, why do I study the Bible? Why do I preach before your people? Is it so that after the service I can have a line of people come to me and say, Pastor, that was a good word. Or is it because I love the people so much that I absolutely desire that God would speak through me to their lives? Because if it's anything other than that, I have a reputation of being alive, but I really may not be. Could it be that even today, church, There are some of us who just have the reputation, the appearance of being alive. But in reality, from God's perspective on the outside, looking into the interior of our hearts, he is honestly having to say, you're dead. You know what that would look like? Great music. No miracles. Great programs in a church, no anointing in the lives of the people. Great teachings, but lives never being transformed by the power of God. Could it be that we just have a reputation of being alive, but are really dead? You see, I can already tell by the look on some of our faces and by your body language that some of us are very uncomfortable right now. Some of you are going like, you're, you're, you're switching from this hip to this hip as you're sitting down. <laughs> I'm trying to look at some of your eyes and you just kind of look somewhere else. No, we have to ask ourselves. Let me, tell, let, let, let me give you an example of this. I know time's advancing, but this is important. There's a passage a scripture that we find it in two places. I'm not going to ask you to go there, but I am going to ask you to study this later on. Okay? Maybe this week. Matthew 21 and Mark chapter 11. If you're taking notes, write that down. Matthew chapter 21 and Mark chapter 11. 
In this passage of scripture, let me, let me tell you what was going on. It's the last week of Jesus' life before he's crucified, before he dies. Okay? Listen to this. Listen to this. This is really important. Sunday, that Sunday, that last week, Jesus comes into Jerusalem. Okay? For the final week of his life before he's crucified. We know that today is Palm Sunday. Why? Because on that day, that Sunday, while Jesus was entering into Jerusalem, he's riding, the, he's riding a colt, the colt of a donkey, okay? And as he makes his way into Jerusalem, the people of that city begin to line the streets. And they line the streets, the Bible says, they, they, they tear off palm branches from trees, and they take off their cloaks, their outer robes. And as Jesus is walking the streets into Jerusalem, they start throwing their cloaks on the ground. They start waving their palm branches and the people start shouting. They start dancing. They start celebrating. They start chanting, Hosanna, Hosanna, blessed is he who comes in the name of the Lord. Can you imagine that scenario? Can you imagine Jesus coming into Jerusalem? He's riding this donkey. He's not riding a stallion. He's not riding a beautiful white horse. He's riding the colt of a, of, a, of, a, of a donkey. But as he's riding, the townspeople, the city people line the street, and they begin to shout, and they begin to... It was the greatest praise and worship service you ever would have been in. They were literally dancing in the street. And Jesus comes in on that one day like the king that he is. To the accolades and to the praises of the people. And they're shouting and they're rejoicing and they're jumping and they're singing and they're clapping their hands. They're doing all of these things. Jesus comes into Jerusalem that Sunday. Monday. Look what happens Monday. This is where we find the passage of scripture that I just gave you. Monday morning, Jesus was in Bethany, just a little village right outside Jerusalem. He's going back into the temple. Jesus knows that he's going into the temple to do something that he's never done before. He's on his way to the temple because he's going to go to the temple and he's going to tell off the people like he has never told them off before. So you're saying Jesus did that? Jesus did that. He goes into the temple for the Christians, for the believers of that day. He knows that he's going in there because he's about to tell them this my, the, the word of my father says that this should be a house of prayer, and you've turned it into a den of thieves. In other words, he knew that the people, the believers of his day, they had taken the worship of God, and they had made it nothing more than just a performance. They had taken the very worship of God, and they had made it nothing more than just some fabricated time of performing for other people. And so Jesus is on his way to the temple to go tell them off, He's going to go overthrow tables. He's going, to, he's going to do it all. But as he's going into Jerusalem, the Bible says that he was hungry. Listen to this. He was hungry. And as he's walking off in the distance, he sees a fig tree that is in full leaf. It is fully leaved. He goes up to the fig tree, intending to find fruit there. Why? Because he was what? Hungry. He goes to the fig tree, and if you know anything about the fig trees, which, which may, maybe you don't because I didn't know much about it, but in Israel, the fruit comes before the leaf. So if a fig tree has leaves on it, then surely there's got to be fruit because the fruit always comes before the leaf. Jesus, because he's hungry, grows up to the fig tree, and he looks for figs, and he doesn't find one single piece of fruit. On that fig tree. The Bible says that his disciples are with him. They see him looking for fruit. He doesn't find any. Look at what the Bible says. The Bible says that Jesus speaks a curse on that tree. He says, never again will you give fruit. And he walks off. He cursed it. The next day, then he goes into the temple and he does all this thing, right? He does all this thing. Tells them off. Tells them that they're a den of, they turned the house of God into a den of thieves, that they're just performing. The next day, they're coming back to, through that area where he cursed the tree. And in one day's time, listen to this. In one day's time, that tree was now dried and withered from the roots up. 
That tree that the day before had been nice and green and looked so appealing and looked so impressive, after Jesus cursed it, within 24, less than 24 hours, that thing was dry. And the disciples were left there. What happened? Okay. My question to you is this. Why did Jesus do that? Why did Jesus curse that fig tree? Why did he pronounce that on them? What made him so angry that in that moment he curses the fig tree? Here's the answer. The fig tree represented the believers of his day. That fig tree represented those people that he was going to go see in the temple that day. They looked nice and green and impressive on the outside. But when Jesus was hungry and went looking for fruit to eat off of that tree, he found none. It was just a performance. It was just an appearance. Jesus, knowing that this tree represented the believers of his day, he curses it. Because why? What is the scripture? We're going to read this later. In one of the messages, Jesus says, God says, I would rather have you hot or cold. Because if you're lukewarm, I'm going to spit you out of my mouth. Meaning, listen, don't be trying to pretend to be something when you're really not. If you're going to say you're a Christian, if you're going to have the appearance of the Christian, then there better be the fruit in your life of a true relationship with the living God. Amen. So when he sees that fig tree, he sees it as a representation of the believers, the, the, the church of his day. That they looked so green and they looked so effective and they looked so active and they looked the part on the outside. But in reality, they were nothing less than empty shells of what a believer really should be. They had an appearance of being alive, but in reality, they were dead. Jesus cursed it. You know why I think, why I think Jesus, what really got Jesus upset about this? Have you ever tried to do something like that to a hungry man? Have you ever, have you ever, have you, maybe you've been hungry. And somebody told you, hey, wait right there, 10 minutes, I'm going to bring you a burger. And they go and they come back and they didn't bring you a burger. What the, where's my burger? You don't mess with a hungry man like that. You know why I think God, got Jesus so upset? Because he was legitimately hungry. And he saw this thing that looked the part and that looked so right. And when he went there to try to get fruit, there was none. You know what I think Jesus did? I think that Jesus put himself in the place of hurting people, of lost people, of people who look at churches every day and they go into a church thinking, maybe I can get help here. Maybe I can be healed here. Maybe God will speak to me here. Maybe God will deliver me here. And they go into a church and they find it empty, void of the power and the anointing of the Holy Spirit. Could it be that even amongst us today, there are still people that have a reputation of being alive, but they are dead. How horrible would that be that we are embedded in a city and in a community of hungry people? Listen to me. How horrible would it be if we are embedded in a community and in a city and in a world full of hungry people. And one day God would speak to them and they say, I always pass a church by. It's this round church on Sarsamora. I don't know what they believe. I don't know what it's about. But I always see it. And they've got this sign that flashes, service, 11 o'clock, Sunday. Service, 11 o'clock, Sunday. And they just say, you know what, I'm hurting. You know what? I'm, I'm down. You know what? I need something. And they come to this church, and what a travesty, what a tragedy it would be for them to come here expecting to find fruit, and they find none. All they find are green leaves, good music, good sound, nice AC. People that say God bless you when the pastor says to tell them God bless you. But in reality, they leave here without experiencing the power of God. So this is what Jesus says. I want you to, look, to go back now to Revelation 3, and we're going to finalize. You 
You have a reputation of being alive. But you are dead. Look at verse 2. Wake up. I love that. Wake up. Some of you might be saying, why did he say wake up when he said they're dead? He didn't say they're sleeping. He said they're dead. And then he says wake up. Here's the reason why. Because even when you're dead, Jesus still has the power to resurrect you from the dead. And all he has to say is, wake up. If you're willing to hear him, if you're willing to respond to his voice, even if in reality you're dead on the inside, by his command of wake up, life can enter you again. Wake up, he says, strengthen what remains and is about to die. For I have not found your deeds complete in the sight of my God. He says, man, I know your deeds. I see your deeds, but they're not complete. They're not full. You're doing some good things, but, but, but you're lacking the heart behind it. You're doing some good works, but where's really the love and the passion of God behind it? You're doing some good things, but where's the power and the anointing of the Holy Spirit that should accompany that? Your deeds, I have not found them complete in the sight of my God. Look at verse 3. Remember, therefore, what you have received and heard. Let me ask you, what have you received as a Christian? What have you received as a believer? You've received the forgiveness of your sins. So what does that mean? Why would I be forgiven of something and then make the choice to go back and do it again? Remember what you've received. What else have you received? You've received salvation. Why would, I, why would I take this beautiful gift of salvation that God has given me and jeopardize it for momentary pleasures? Why would I take this beautiful gift of salvation that God has given me and jeopardize it for nonsense, for stupidity, for things that really don't have any eternal value? Why would I do that? God is saying, remember what you've been given. Remember the forgiveness of your sins. Remember your salvation. The book of Philippians says that we are to work out our salvation with fear and trembling, not work for, for your salvation, because salvation only comes by faith through grace. But you are to work out your salvation once you receive the grace of God, once you've received the forgiveness of your sins, once you receive salvation, there ought to be fruit now that is working out of your life every single day. Work out your salvation. He says, remember what you have received. Remember what you heard. What have you heard? You have heard the gospel of Jesus Christ. You have heard the beautiful message that to this day still transforms lives. That God loved us so much that he gave his only begotten son. And that if we will trust him and put our faith in him, we will not perish. But we will have everlasting life. That's the gospel. Remember what you've heard. Remember the instruction of the Word of God. Remember what you're hearing today. Don't leave this and then over Red Lobster, over Mama Margie's, over whatever restaurant you go to, you forget what you are hearing. Listen to it. Remember it. This is a living Word of God. Let it produce fruit inside of your life. Remember what you received. Remember what you heard. Obey it and repent. But listen to this. If you do not wake up, Notice that he didn't say, but if I don't wake you up. Because now waking up, once he says, wake up, he gives the command. And he has given the command. Now it becomes our responsibility to wake up. If you do not wake up, I want you to listen to this. I will come like a thief. And you will not know at what time I will come to you. I want you to, I want you to see this. There's two pictures that the scriptures, that the Bible gives us about the return of Christ. Let me give you the first one, because I like that one much better. The first picture that we see in the, in the scriptures return, uh, regarding the return of Christ is this. It's the picture of a bridegroom coming for his bride. And uh, on Tuesday, we ended our, our service with this scripture. Last verses in Revelation. The spirit and the bride say, come, Lord Jesus. Come. That's a beautiful picture about the return of the Lord. The bridegroom coming for his bride. To be united. To be, to be established forever in the fullness of, of that covenant with him. There's a second picture that we find in the scripture over and over again concerning the, 
the return of Christ. This picture is a thief. A thief. Coming when you least expect it. Why does the scripture give us those two pictures of the return of Christ? Because for those who are saved, for those who are looking for the Lord, for those who are living their lives for him, they have continued to work out their salvation, and they're living with an expectancy of the return of Christ. Their hearts and their lives are right before the Lord. It will be this picture of that bridegroom coming for his bride. It's going to be a wonderful moment. It's going to be a celebration when the Lord returns. And the Spirit will say, come Lord, I'm ready. But while there will be that picture taking place in the lives of people, for some other people, there will also be this. Because Matthew 24 says that two men will be walking in the field. One will be taken, one will be left behind. And the one left behind will be saying, what happened? Where'd he go? And why didn't I go? Like a thief. How do you want to experience the return of Christ? I want to leave you with this question today. How do you want to experience the return of Christ? As that bride waiting for the bridegroom? Or that's pers- as that person who's left wondering what happened because a thief came when he least expected it? If you're here today and you're saying, I want to experience it like a bride waiting for her bridegroom, then let me tell you something. Don't just have a reputation of being alive. Be alive. Don't just have a reputation of being alive. Be alive in Christ. Have a real, living, true, awesome relationship with God every single day of your life. Don't just wait for Sunday to come and get things right with the Lord. And although this is not theologically sound, but I think you understand my my thought here. Don't just wait for Sunday to get right with God, because what if he comes on Wednesday? In other words, don't just live your life by a moment-to-moment experience with God. Every now and then, I'm going to have a moment with him. No, no, no. Every single day, I'm going to have a thriving relationship with Christ. I'm going to pray. I'm going to be in the word of God. I'm going to let him speak to me. I'm going to worship him. When I come to church, then that's going to be the culmination of an entire week where I've been dealing with him. I've been meditating on him. I've been talking to him and he's been talking to me. You know what would happen? When you begin to do that, when you start having an everyday relationship with the Lord and you start having an everyday relationship with the Lord and you start having an everyday relationship with God and I start having an everyday relationship with God and you start having an everyday relationship with and you start having an everyday, you know what's going to happen? When we all come together, there's going to be a massive explosion of the power and the anointing of the Holy Spirit. Why? Because we're not coming dry and we're not coming empty. We're coming to church filled up and we start to overflow and there's going to be an overflow of anointing here, an overflow of power there, an overflow of glory here, an overflow of the power of God here and all of us together will erupt as a volcano erupting for the glory and the honor of God. Would you stand with me right there where you are? Here's what we're going to do to finalize. I want to see every man. I want to see every woman. I want to see every young man, every young woman, every boy, every girl that would say, God, I don't want to just have a reputation of being alive, but I want to be alive in you. I want to have a thriving relationship with you every single day of my life. I want to know the power of your Holy Spirit. I want to know the communion of the sweet fellowship of the Holy Spirit of God in my life. If that's you, would you get out of your seat and come to this altar and together we're going to call out to God. Together we're going to seek God. Together we're going to come before Him with rejoicing, with singing, with repentance. We're going to come before Him with sincerity of heart. No longer will we just have a reputation of being alive. No longer will we just look the part. No longer will this just be a performance. My worship will no longer be a performance. My praise will no longer be a performance. My preaching will no longer be a performance. My testimony will no longer be a performance. My ministry will no longer be a performance. My service will no longer be a performance. Everything that I have and everything that I am will give glory and honor to you, God. My life in you, Lord. My life, come on, begin to talk to the Lord. If you need to repent right now, repent. If there's been sin hiding in your heart, bring it out before the Lord right now. He's coming. He's coming, church.
and he's coming for a church that is ready. He's coming for a church that is spotless, without wrinkle. He's coming for a church that is looking for him. He's coming for a church that is expecting him. We say, come, Lord Jesus. Come, Lord Jesus.